let's just uh, let's just go for it without the intro because I put the intro down. Okay. All right. So you're we're online. Okay. <laughs> Welcome to the world beyond belief. My name is Paul Marco, and with me today is Mindy Yerkin. She's yeah. going to be reading the chat room and help coordinate uh, our our discussion. We've got uh, we're going to do the same. Okay. Here we go. With us today are the three members of the forum that were last week. Now we're going to, today we're going to call our forum the Techno Crime Task Force Forum because uh, targeted sounded too at effect. And we want to be more proactive in this thing where we're really doing something about it. Today we've got with us, again, Karen Stewart. She's an, uh, a past NSA employee that's in this program. Uh, we have Dr. Catherine Horton. She's a particle physicist who is in this program. And we have a famous writer, uh, Ramola D, who is also in this program and helping with this forum. Last week, if you were here, if you listened to the whole thing, it really got, uh, we broadened it from, <coughs> from uh, just targets to the general population. Since we all are, sure enough, everybody that's awakening and as opposed to this new world order are uh, in the program. So we started talking about broader subjects. And uh, this week, we're going we're gonna to start. Um, there were some ideas for topics. Did someone have a, to start it off? We were, before we got on the air, we were talking about Mark M. Rich's book, New World War, Revolutionary Methods for Political Control. And I know uh, Dr. Eric Kallstrom and I have done a program on that book, but we're, we've got it in our home now and we're reading it. And we're really thinking about that, uh, Everybody that's awakening, everybody that doesn't want to go into the hive mind, everybody that's uh, fighting the new world order is a candidate for this program and will be picked up at some point. So the people we're talking to today are kind of the advanced guard, people who are dealing with this and actually in a large measure overcoming it and functioning relatively normally under this program. Would you, would you say I, I characterize that uh, uh, correctly, functioning relatively normally? <clears throat> Trying. Trying. Uh, you're still uh, going, uh, going to your work sometimes. I'm sure Ramola's still teaching art. Well, you know, it's a case of striving to function normally, but really battling so many challenges. And that's one of the things we were talking about yesterday, right, Catherine, Karen? We kind of did a sort of a mini uh, pre-conversation prior to this, um, this moment right now, this hangout, uh, where we were talking about various um, aspects of our lives that have changed. Because all three of us, I would think, are very highly functioning individuals under normal circumstances. But currently, we are not under normal circumstances. These are actually abnormal circumstances. Yeah. And what we are striving to do is sort of get back to ourselves and function as much as we can. But we are indeed spending a lot of time on this particular topic, on this whole issue of being targeted. We are still trying to you know, write to officials about our own situations. We're working with other people who are writing to us. And in my case, I'm working on articles, and in Catherine and Karen's case, they're doing a lot of, you know, activism as well. Um, they're calling people, they're advocating for people. So in a sense, this has changed a great deal. And actually, I wanted to make a connection there, Paul, to what you brought up, uh, Mark Rich's book. <clears throat> because one of the things he talks about is um, he goes through several stages of what he calls, well, actually, this is military terminology, I think, revolutions in military affairs over time, which actually marks different time periods where weaponry kind of accelerated, you know, from gunpowder to whatever the next stage was. And then there were nuclear weapons. And now we're in the electronic weapons stage. 
And you see, that's the whole thing that we need to kind of point out. Because not only are these electronic weapons here, they're being used, and because they are by nature invisible and stealth weaponry, the whole of society has been put under a kind of a spell, a massive psyop spell, that these weapons don't exist. But the three of us and everybody else, you know, who with us are being assaulted in these ways, are sort of at the vanguard of experiencing the assault and the onslaught of these weapons. And we're here to tell the rest of the world, look, these weapons are being used and they do exist. Mm -hmm. So. That's a blessing. That's, I, I think actually, you know, um, Ramula, that's such a wonderful introduction because you, you started off with putting your finger right on, on the issue here. These weapons don't just exist. They have been around for 40 years and have been perfected, at least 40 years, and have been perfected through that time. And at the same time, there has been, because they are so incredibly powerful, I think very early on, I, I think I remember um, Dr. Barry Trower saying that, you know, microwave weapons didn't used to be classified. They, um, they used to talk openly, and he researched openly into microwave weapons and their effects, and then they became classified. And the question is why? And I think it's because they found out that it's, uh, and, and with they, with they as always, I mean the intelligence agencies, the military and, and the cartel behind them, um, they found out how hugely powerful they are as weapons. And that's why we see this really unusual phase of it first being very public and then suddenly there's silence. And, um, and what, what we've seen is that this has been built up to, to an incredibly large weapon system that's very advanced, very um, well, highly functional. Um, it's, it's just, um, it can control you in the most minute details and can cause very precisely calculated damage. And um, this weapon system, it, it doesn't just exist. I think it is the most powerful weapon ever developed and it's now active and shooting, I think. This is, this is how reality was shared apart over 40 years. So microwaves were publicly researched and that I think society back then was more or less in sync with itself because you had you know, some really powerful weaponry, but it was open research. So people could keep a tab on it. And that's the only way a society can remain healthy. Then what happened is became classified. They continued to build up this huge system. At the same time, there was this incredible disinformation in, in the population about the existence and everybody was um, you know, um, slandered who came forward and said that they exist or they were victims. And now this weapon system became ever more advanced. The population became ever more ignorant. And we've got now this huge... <coughs> you know, abyss between um, reality and what people know. And essentially this abyss is being used by the, by the military intelligence cartel to not just systematically murder people. Um, they have built it up to, to such a sophisticated takedown system that um, I think, I mean, I've heard um, rumors that they essentially have um, computer simulations and and also you know computer databases where they keep tab on keep tabs on absolutely everybody and i think by now they can decide what sort of illnesses we get and when we die and i think that's exactly the the point that's exactly the point and um and, and we are now at the at the cutting edge of this because it, this weapon system is being applied to us and it's integrated with the surveillance networks and so on. Mm -hmm. And when, when we are, we essentially day by day, we live in this reality and we, are, we see that there's this war going on with, an act, with the most powerful active weapon system ever devised. It's like, it's like try, if, as if you were you know, at the edge of um, you know, Hiroshima you saw that happen, and then you go back to a normal community and you try to explain to them what you just saw. If you said to them, if these people didn't know about atomic weapons, and you said to them, I saw an entire city obliterated within a second, and everything burn up, they wouldn't believe you, because they would say, how could it be? You, know, it, it, you can't have that much energy. The thing is, you can, because it's a nonlinear uh, process. And now we have the same thing that we live in this reality. We say, my God, there's this war 
people have been essentially attacked. I think, you know, the, well, we don't have precise numbers, but the rumors go between, you know, hundreds of thousands and millions of people are being attacked with this. There is an open war. It is pretty open if people care to look. There's an open war on the, um, on the population. We are in this war. We are being mutilated to death by these weapons. And at the same time, we live literally 50 meters to a parallel society where people are perfectly oblivious. And the reason for that oblivious is the way the media has been completely corrupted. Yes. You know, I mean, you know, literally, I the media is now the voice of the CIA. It's the voice of the government. It's the voice of all of these dark intelligence agencies which are seeking to keep these weapons hidden. Because this is like their coup d'etat. This is like their special weapon. You know, it's, it's stealth weapon. They don't have to confess to it. There's plausible deniability written all over this weapon system. And they're going for it in a big, big way. And this is why they've totally taken it undercover, underground. They've totally taken this entire weapon system underground. And the fact that it's being used on us, and this also brings me to, um, you know, the, the, the wonderful analogy you had of going to the edge of the abyss and looking down on Hiroshima and then going back to try to tell people about it. <clears throat> Hiroshima was a very sort of open manifestation of the atomic bomb, right? I mean, everybody in the world saw it eventually on film and so forth. <clears throat> We don't have a similar physical manifestation in this case. We don't have access to, to film, and we never will, except through our bodies and through our experiences. And it's sort of once removed because of that. Um, and I want to bring in Karen here because we were talking yesterday about <clears throat> synthetic telepathy which is one of the weapons that's being used. What is synthetic telepathy? It's putting voices into people's heads using various kinds of high tech, including microwaves, right? There's different ways apparently of inducing voices in people's heads these days. There's bone conduction, there's microwave hearing, and there's a couple ways of doing it as well. And they hit the auditory cortex rather than the ear and send signals in as well. And there's something about sending two signals at two different frequencies to both ears, and the cancellation of that produces a third frequency that in, on which can be carried voices and sound. So all these tech technologies exist, the patterns exist, and Karen was talking about how these have actually been tested out in the Gulf War, right? Or, or the Iraq War? Uh, yes, they actually... We, we, uh, I was talking to Paul and Mindy about this before we went on the air. They're... Um, Somebody did a YouTube video concerning the battle for the Fallujah airport. And if you remember, the American forces and the Iraqi forces were head to head and the Americans were not making any progress whatsoever. Well, the decision apparently was made to bring in, uh, let's say, microwave, because that's what it looks like to me. Iraqi forces with microwave and they melted them. The families of these soldiers said they went out to see what had gone on, tried to find their loved ones, and they were finding skulls with teeth burned and bits of tissue left on the skull and very little to no body, maybe a bag of bones type of thing. And they were horrified, you know, went back to their villages and told people about it. But in the meantime, the American military came in, according to the YouTube, took every single Iraqi body. You know, put it in a truck or, or something, and then also took two inches of topsoil, scraped that up, put it in the trucks, and then took everything out to the desert in an un, uh, uh, undisclosed location and buried it all. Buried all the evidence that they had used a microwave um, high energy weapon, because that's against the Geneva Convention. That was a war crime. Yeah. But this is the only you know, the bits and pieces that we are garnering, garnering from the Iraqi war is they're really the only solid evidence that we have that, yes, they have been used on human beings. And the, and the thing is, they're so easy to use because uh, unlike a nuclear bomb, you don't destroy the city. You don't destroy the water supply. You don't contaminate the, you know, the soil that you grow food in. You use them, the people are gone, and there's no evidence. 
you know, you take everything and then you can use the city, you can use the airport as you want and you haven't destroyed something as where with a nuclear bomb, that area is gone for your use forever. Mm -hmm. And, you know, essentially forever it's gone, but these are more likely to be used because they don't totally destroy the area like a nuclear bomb does. And that makes them even more so uh, more mm -hmm. dangerous. In fact, if you listen to some of the videos that Putin, President Putin has put out, it's amazing that somebody who has that type of power is getting on the video and, you know, whether he's with a, a group of Americans and Russians talking, negotiating, or whether he's making a speech, he, in essence, is begging, begging the United States to stop this research into the energy weapons. Because he has said, we have parity. The world, China, Russia, America, we don't want to kill our people. We don't want to use these weapons. We're good. You know, we have no desire to hurt you. You should have no desire to hurt us. And we can function and live. But if you're going toward this development of the directed energy weapons that totally turns everything topsy-turvy, you're going to force us to act. Well, what is it they might, might do? A preemptive nuclear strike, perhaps, or an electromagnetic pulse? Well, if you take an electromagnetic pulse, you take an airplane, you fly it over the United States, the middle of the United States, a mile up, set off an atomic bomb. You've got an electromagnetic pulse that puts us back in the dark ages. Probably two thirds or more of the population will die within the first six months. And the Russians will not have to even invade. This, the United States will just die out and then they can come and take the farmland or whatever it is that they want or need. The water, I mean, China has very little potable water and the United States is gifted with some of the largest amount of potable water uh, in any country in the world. So we have very, uh, we have uh, natural resources that a lot of people would love to have. And this would be an excellent way to do it. You know, just set off an EMP, gone, everything gone, people starve to death, kill each other. And then the United States is basically, comes here. So this is an existential threat on not only the level of uh, continually exposing us to these uh, electronic devices that destroy our DNA, but it also is an ex existential threat to the survival of our country in the immediate future. So this is something people have got to realize. I mean, they may hunker down and say, well, you know, I, my family and I are just going to stay over here. We're just going to do what we normally do. And we're going to hope it bypasses us, let them take out the people who are the big mouths and causing trouble. But no, they're coming for you next because this is a societal control uh, mechanism as well as an assassination, select an assassination program. So you have two threats that are mounting. And people have got to realize that it's not just not somebody else's tough luck for speaking up. Mm -hmm. and, and what you just pointed to about how Russia is very interested in closing down this program, and yet <clears throat> the U.S. has simply forged ahead. You know, we also have to remember that in, in was it 1999 or 2000, um, the U European Union Parliament was approached by various activists in this country and around the world you know, I think Dr. Nick Begich was part of that, uh, Lynn Sagala of the U.S. Psychotronics Association. Um, and Lynn Sagala is an insider whistleblower because she used to work for Lockheed Martin. And um, Paul Baird, an activist in, in Australia, his information was used. Um, they succeeded in persuading the European Parliament to, um, to issue a kind of global ban on these weapons of remote manipulation of humans. Um, and also the UNIDER, United Nations um, Institute for Disarmament Research, they, um, they also noted that, you know, that um, any weapons that engage in remote manipulation of human beings should be banned. And this seems to have totally fallen by the wayside. I mean, nobody seems to have kept to these strictures, least of all the United States. 
And that was, if that happened in 2000, I mean, look at where we are now in 2017. And this program, judging by the increasing numbers of those who are being targeted and assaulted with these COVID weapons, increasing, you know, they're increasing, Maddie, the number's increasing. So that tells us something, that the program has not just continued, it seems to have ramped up. So as you say, Here. go ahead, Paul. Well, I'm I'm sorry, Ramal, you froze up. That's the only reason I interjected. Oh, I see. Can you hear what you were saying? Oh, okay. Um, no, I was just saying, so the, the program appears to have ramped up. So there seems to be more and more uh, people being targeted worldwide, not just in the United States, also in Europe, and actually even in parts of Russia. And which brings us to the question, well, who is doing this? Who is running this program? It's sort of an identical program around the world. And who we are hitting are people who, as Karen said, are outspoken in the community, people who are whistleblowers, people who are activists, people who are writers, journalists, old media journalists. We are the ones who are being hit. And why are we being hit? And how is it that there's such a similarity in the, in the nature of the assault? across continents, which brings us to the question, well, who's running this show? And I think Catherine has some answers there, right? You were talking <laughs> about intelligence agencies suddenly sort of amalgamating and yeah. um, being run as one big intelligence agency. Yes, and I think it's, it's very, I mean, I can, I, can ex I, you know, I can explain the background as I see it. And um, under that light, we should, um, uh, you know, I think society should wake up that the intelligence agencies were the one part of government no one was allowed to talk about. We're allowed to talk about the police and, um, you know, malpractice in the police. Similarly, you know, military officers going mentally AWOL and shooting people up or committing, you know, horrific, um, you know, serial killings or, or rapes. That's also, we can talk about that. But the intelligence agencies are at least the size of the military. Yet, I don't remember a single case of some horrific crimes by intelligence agents being openly discussed. You know, if you look at the police, every single day there's something, you know, something. Because that's just, it, and people have to understand with systems that size, it's natural. It is actually natural. That's what you expect. You expect a certain rate of serious malpractice because that's just what people are like. So when we have the intelligence agencies and there's just silence, for decades, and I cannot remember a single case of serious malpractice from an intelligence agent, what it means is that uh, there have been years and years of silence. And the question is, or, or cover-up rather, and when a system operates under cover-up for decades, the problems get worse because people who, who are committing crimes stay in the system, get promoted, and it just gets worse and worse. So by now, I'm just thinking about it this way, we can already tell that the biggest problem in our world must be by now the one the very large system that no one was allowed to talk about, and that's the intelligence agencies. You know, I mean, the, the banks are pretty opaque as well, but we did have recently, you know, huge inquiries into banking. And yes, they haven't led to any convictions, but at least we do have handles on them. Now, the intelligence agencies are even more lethal because they do research into, for example, electromagnetic weapons, but traditionally also into poisons, into every type of killing people. So that's just the, the basics of the intelligence agencies. And then come to that, this system tendency that if you, if you started off with a society somewhere at, at time zero, and then you think, okay, you establish an intelligence agency, who are they going to be most nervous about? Well, it's going to be another country's intelligence agency because those are the people who are going to spy on them professionally. So any intelligence agency will worry about other intelligence agencies the most to start with. So that's how it sets up. So what do they do about it? Well, they try to infiltrate each other. Okay, so that's the natural systems tendency. So, and they will keep doing that. So once they infiltrate each other, well, they will also try to, um, and, and I think by the... Um, testimony of Kay Griggs, it, it also, she says that they were encouraged to marry other intelligence agents, you know, to intermarry. Yes, of course, because then you can spy on another system even better. And this has been going on for centuries, for absolutely centuries. You know, the intelligence agencies are ancient. So it follows that what we have now is a highly secretive system where crime and malpractice and misdemeanor and psychopathology was never purged ever before in the history of mankind. They have all by now intermarried and infiltrated each other. And then there's another thing. Imagine 
you have you know one intelligence agency infil infiltrating the other the other one infiltrates them at some point they have a total mix of personnel you know they literally exchanged you know they have got internships with each other effectively so these intelligence agencies will naturally just morph and given that this has been the tendency for millennia not just the last couple of hundred years by now it's it should be obvious to everybody that all intelligence agencies in the world are by now morphed they are to all intents and purposes morphed so when you have all this cross infiltration intermarrying and so on people rise you know through the ranks and at some point you, you, you literally just have one organization it, it's just an, a natural system tendency and um, when you have one organization like that, it becomes obvious that, okay, somewhere, somewhere in the world there will be a HQ, and that's going to be probably the, the, most, the most dominant military hub in history, you know, because once it's like that, it will stay like that and just accumulate power, okay. And we can talk about what that might be, but it doesn't matter. What's really important is to realize that actually the KGB and MI6 and also Chinese intelligence, they are just branch officers of the same entity by now. They must be, because there was never ever in the history of these systems any mechanism to prevent it from happening. Much the opposite. They encouraged intermarrying. They encouraged cross-infiltration. They are all one. So what we have now is essentially these intelligence agencies just being one happy club, partially a happy family, because they're all intermarried and they all have, you know, their, you know, sex parties together. And there's the rest of mankind who's actually doing productive work. And this system is now out attacking us. Because, yeah. And I, I think also there's a connection between the intelligence agencies and the bankers. Yes. You know, we're talking about the, the huge banks. We're talking about the BIS, really, the one the bank that you were talking about, Catherine, the bank in Switzerland, right? Yeah. Absolutely, because with the banks, and you know, if, if any, because the intelligence agencies are a system that's very opaque, we can't check if, the, if what I'm saying is true. But what you can do is go to a more, you know, somewhat more transparent system and see that that tendency, that system trend holds up. So it, it holds up with the large um, global corporations. They have m merged, you know, so clothes um, manufacturers are now pretty much the same company all around the world, the same few companies. And the same with banks. So we now, mankind has woken up to the fact that all the central banks are private. And the central bank of central banks is the BIS, the Bank of International Settlement in, um, in um, Bern. So in banking, they already talk about the one bank. Because the same tendency in bank, you know, it happens in banking as well. You know, you want to, um, especially banking, you want the assets of another bank so they merge and they acquire each other's assets to be, become even bigger. So the same system trend exists. And then the question is, well, if the central bank of central banks and some other structure, ownership structures above them are the biggest pool of money or, you know, one of the biggest pools of money, and wouldn't it pay for them to just occasionally buy the services of an intelligence agency because you know you have a sense your business intelligence when you're running the stock market is really worth money because you can predict what's going to happen so again the natural tendency is for the for the money pot to buy the spies mm -hmm. and this is also not just from yesterday so by now i think it's it's pretty obvious that all the intelligence agencies are merged and by now they are owned full by the banks. Yes, lock, stock, and barrel. And I don't think it's occasional. I think it's complete. I think that it's a complete takeover. The intelligence agencies currently belong to the multinationals and to the central bankers. They are, in fact, the face of the elite. And this is why we are being waged war on. Because why are we being seen as threats? Why are writers and scientists and intelligence agencies, intelligence analysts who are retired being seen as threats? You know, we're, we're being seen as threats only because you have this huge um, elite cartel striving to wipe out dissent as they roll in their new idea of what humanity should be. You know, this is their idea based on their own supreme hubris, where they've decided that humanity is destined to be their slaves and they need to run the show. They need to be the ones, you know, selling things to people and forcing them to buy them, sort of keeping us in a uh, co continuous consumer cycle 
but also a slave cycle. You know, the master-slave dominance uh, ratio and relationship. This is what they want to establish. So, although it appears, you know, it, it's, it's almost like we are sitting inside a novel and speaking right now. We are inside 1984. You know, we are inside Brave New World. <laughs> Yes, exactly. And we're the little ants looking around at the, you know, the bulldozers heading toward us and trying to figure out what on earth is going on and what can we do. But, but, but I think the way to understand this is to understand, um, again, going back to Mark Rich and the New World Wars, um, Paul, is that um, our military industrial complex has kind of merged with, you know, the powers that be, the superstructure behind it. Is our military defending our countries anymore? Or is our military attacking the citizens current? Hierarchy of elite. It's all become a business. Yeah. yeah, it's everything has become a business. Everything has a cash value associated with it. And we are and the so cash and we're the cash cows. So in such a situation, you need cash cows, you need someone or something to exploit, to get money out of, in order to keep creating wealth for these people who imagine that this is going to be an endless cycle and can last forever. You know, it's like digging the resources out of the earth. The earth is not going to keep yielding resources forever, but these people imagine it can, imagine they can keep doing it. I think you said so, something, sorry, I think you said something really good. You know, they think that they are creating wealth and actually, no, they're creating work for themselves. I think that's the mechanism because, you know, the elite, um, they have, you know, and, and also as a, as a caveat on the elite, what follows also, if we think about the elite as the big money structure that then bought the intelligence agencies and we've got this canopy of, you know, um, intelligence agencies, military, tech, you know, companies, and then the banks, um, is that all these um, type of um, pursuits <laughs> attract psychopaths. They just do. I mean, the military is certainly not short of psychopaths when it's about serial killing people, you know, for money. The intelligence agencies with essentially just um, continuous deception um, you know, psychopaths are perfect because they don't feel guilt, they don't feel remorse, you know, they don't have a problem with lying. They excel in the intelligence agencies and the same in banking, you know, the ruthlessness. Um, so what we have now is essentially a, a big system that operates almost like a big sieve, you know, that it, but it's a sieve upwards. So, you know, the, the people who pass through the sieve and make it to the top are the people who are the most psychopathic. So when we look about, you know, think about the goals of the elite, we must not approach it as, oh, are these the goals that a normal person would have? Because mm -hmm. we don't have the same value st system and the same mental capacities as a psychopath. We have to think, you know, um, when we hear theories or, you know, um, reports about what the elite want, we have to think, is this what a psychopath would want? Does it make sense? And if the answer is yes, and if it sounds truly sick and utterly, you know, whacked out that's probably true that's what they want and um you know ramola you put it so well they think that they are generating wealth no they are generating entertainment for themselves and work for the system because they there's at the top the elite they're total psychopaths and at the bottom which is the, the only systems we actually experience actually further down um, those are essentially the systems who want to, you know, suck up to the elite because that's where the money's coming from. And they just want to keep the money flowing. So, you know, even looking at what William, William Binney came up with as a slogan for the intelligence agencies, he said, keep the, um, keep the problem going so the money keeps flowing. That's mm -hmm. exactly it. That's the structure below. So that's what we're dealing with. And now the logic has totally flipped on its side. You know, because now the logic of the military is not to protect their own backyard, their own nation. The goal of the military seems to be to just get, you know, um, essentially rise through the ranks of the military to then get onto the private corporations who are, you know, producing military tech. Right. It's the same with the intelligence agents. For example, if you look at the um, recent heads of intelligence, certainly in Britain, there's this, um, you know, this... Um, what's it called? Like these round doors, you know, they essentially just... Um, the revolving doors. 
exactly revolving doors they um actually just just pass into the the private um um corporations mm -hmm. to earn money and mm -hmm. so now the logic of every single system that we we have has flipped on its back you know it's not true that the military is there to protect us anymore the military is there to allow a few men to earn a lot of money whatever that <laughs> might be Exactly. And if you look at what's going on in the world with world politics, and again, it comes back to the intelligence agencies, right, particularly the CIA and what we know it's been doing for, for decades, fomenting wars in various countries. And now we have, you know, the creation of ISIS, the creation of Al Qaeda, um, basically the creation of terrorism abroad, the creation of the creation of wars. So it's like the military um, so th th there you see the sort of the, the back and forth thing between the military and the intelligence agencies. You know, the intelligence agencies go out and foment and create the systems and scenarios of war. And then you have the military coming along saying, oh, we have to protect America. We have to protect Europe. And we're out here with our ships, our battleships and our, you know, our fabulous fighter planes. And we're going to drop bombs on a thousand Ari uh, Syrian children and Iraqi children and wipe them out and come back and tell everybody that we have won the war. We have protected the homeland. And um, then we roll out in our media our cover stories to, to, keep the, to keep Americans in a permanent state of absolute, you know, it, uh, being dumbed down and not having any real awareness of what's going on in the world with all these false stories of valor and heroism and, um, you know, purple stars and red stars and so forth. So it's, it's a whole, it's a cycle of deception that keeps repeating and repeating and repeating. Um, and that unfortunately is part of the system that you're talking about. There is a system in place and so people who question the system, who question the status quo, become problematic and dangerous. Right. I, I also think that uh, the fact that it's all psychopathic might be the Achilles heel. Because psychopaths don't play nice with one another. They take over from one another. Maybe that's what we're seeing with China and Russia now. Because they're all, as uh, Catherine said, they're all in the same uh, boat. They're all connected together uh, through intermarriage. I mean, the uh, KGB, would used to be the KGB, I don't know what it's called now. It definitely has to be in bed with the Mossad, it has to be in bed with the CIA. So maybe we're seeing, uh, I mean, in the final analysis, there's gonna be one psychopath who's gonna rule this. And the rest of the psychopaths are gonna attack one another. And I wonder if that's what we're seeing with Russia and China now or whether we're just seeing a, an ongoing puppet show of, of, of whatever. I don't know. But we're dealing with psychopaths here. So it's a mm -hmm. whole different type of brain structure. Yeah, I think, I think what, what you said is, is, I think, exactly what we're seeing. We see um, a careful choreography. It's all stage managed, you know? I mean, the, the intelligence agencies infiltrated the media and there's a media lockdown. So all the normal people can't get justice because the judiciary has been infiltrated. They can't, you know, have their stories heard because the um, media are infiltrated always by the intelligence agencies. And meanwhile, we have this insider group of um, infiltrators, informants, and um, ex-agents and current agents running the show and um, you know, liaising with other agents across the world. And I think what we are seeing is exactly a, a mix between a careful choreography and, and in between the, the usual heel snapping and backstabbing of psychopaths, I think. I think this is what we're seeing here. And it's, yes, it's, it's true that they have a, some common plan, but at the same time, at the drop of the hat, they would just put a dagger into each other's back. You know, in fact, they're just waiting for it. You know, mm -hmm. they are just waiting for some sort of um, event where they could just do that and dislodge someone above them to take their place. And um, for example, last, uh, I mean, the way I analyze it is that this system has um, it's like a it's almost like a blade you know it starts turning as the intelligence agencies grow together they find out they can have common business plans and make a lot of money from war so they keep doing it keep doing it and at some point it accelerates under its own inertia and now with technology the killing has accelerated the torture the subjugation and you know it just gets faster and faster and ever more psychopathic 
But when you have this system that's essentially like a, a fast rotating blade, you know, operating under its own inertia, it's as good as out of control because there's, there's not enough people at the core who could even stop that if they wanted to. I think that's the truth. If some senior psychopath suddenly, you know, I don't know, saw the light of day and wanted to change course, he couldn't. He couldn't with the agreement of, of many other psychopaths as well. And the real danger is now that we have these people who are essentially mentally ill at the top. There is this huge killing machine that is out of control. It's now, you know, it has already devastated the Middle East and is now wearing towards Europe and the US. And we're already, you know, at the forefront of this. But the plan, I think, is because in this system, these psychopaths also are very convenient people. So they see that they've got this killing machine going. What would be their coming business plan? How could they make more money? And I say the way to make money after you devastated the Middle East is to devastate Europe, to asset strip Europe through, through a big war. And that's what I'm seeing. And that's why I'm, I'm so, um, you know, terrified. But if you try to talk to even military leaders here, you, you discover how degenerate the system has become. And that's what really scared me. Last week, I went all the way to military HQ and I went in and I demanded to talk to somebody. And eventually the person I, I talked to, you know, identified himself as a senior intelligence agent. I said, okay, fine. I just wanted to put in my, my case file. I wanted to say, look, this is happening to me. And I'm, I'm saying this is really bad because if a nation starts killing its own intellectuals, its own scientists, it has happened in the past. But every single time, shortly after, there was an invasion. This is usually, you know, just like with the intelligence action in Poland, that was the precursor to removing the, the people who can spot this trend quickly so that then you can march in with the military and take them over. And I said, well, this is happening across Europe and the Western world. Um, in the US, you already have, you know, UN tanks, you've got the FEMA camps, you've got lots of strange things happening. In Europe, we have the refugee streams destabilizing us, many other things. If I look at it, to me, it very much looks like the setup to the next world war, which will be staged here in Europe. And the goal is to utterly asset strip us here in Europe, because we are now the only, well, not the only pot of money left, but we're the next one in reach. You know, and as Karen said, in the US, it would be resources, you know, here in Europe, I mean, maybe resources, maybe also some other stuff and accumulated wealth. But if I look at it, I think Switzerland would be a wonderful target because they've got all this weapon tech stashed away here. I think it's the NATO you know, weapons cache and they've got all, not all the gold, but they've got a lot of gold, you know. So if you want to get at a lot of wealth going to the, you know, the bank safe, of uh, of Europe is probably the way to go, and then I'm, I I say all these things to a senior intelligence agent at the military HQ, and his biggest concern is to check out his own looks in the reflective surfaces. I mean, you know, I, I made a detailed YouTube video about the event, but it just shows us the degeneracy of our own so-called leaders. These people don't get it. They don't get it. You know, we have we have now news media where it's not journalists writing the articles, it's intelligence agent, mm -hmm. agents, you know. But we don't have intelligence agencies with intelligence agents. We have intelligence agencies with, with thugs from organized crime. That's mm -hmm. what's so crazy, you know. If you want to find an intelligence agent who doesn't do drug running, you have to go probably to The Guardian, you know. Or the Telegraph, to go, you have to go to the media. If you're in the intelligence agency, you're surrounded by people who do drug running, you know, organized pedophile rings. Mm -hmm. And if you go to it's the military, you've got businessmen, you know, I mean, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, it's all you're, exactly, you're exactly right on target. It's hard to find the people that are outside of that system and see the system are us. And we're the ones who they can't allow to write and talk. I think they're allowing us to get away with it now because they want to see how far we're going to go. They want to see how awake we're going to become. And maybe to give other people a chance to wake up. We posted an article this week on what's going to happen to the rest of us. What's going to happen to the people who go along? And 
um, I, it wasn't exactly about that, but I, I made it about that in my mind. What they're doing with the chemtrails is they're spraying barium. Mm -hmm. And the reason they're spraying barium, one of the reasons, is because it breaks down the plasma brain barrier. So the things that they put in your blood, or you breathe in and get in your blood, can go right in your brain. And you know, of course, they're dumping nanoparticles with this barium. So these nanoparticles, I'm not sure whether they're biological or mechanical, um, can go in, go into your brain, and be subject to uh, waves, electronic waves from cell towers. And now in the United States and probably in Europe, they're going to the 5G where they're uh, increasing the potency of all the, uh, the uh, cell towers. So, you know, if you're, if you're not awake and you're just going to stumble into this, that's the plans for you. If you're awake, uh, like I think the people that are watching this broadcast are, uh, you're going to be subject to these more individualized uh, attacks. Uh, so that's the scenario if we don't wake up and do something. Just my two Yes, absolutely. And I think that's the other side of what we need to talk about. There's all of this that's going on, that's happening both at an individual level, as you say, Paul. There's this political repression that's being directed and targeted at certain people. And then there's, you know, a more amorphous, nebulous targeting that involves the whole of humanity. You know, whether it's in Europe or Asia or, or in, the, in the Americas. Uh, we're all being subjected to these horrific aerosols, these horrific entries. And along with them, you know, all of them, the harp emanations and the, um, the ELFs that go along with it, the, uh, you know, which carries with it mind control possibilities, you know, the, the dumbing down of people's brains and, and minds, the removal of your short term memory, the ability to induce Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, dementia in large swaths of selected populations and so forth. So, so we have all of this being directed at us. What can we do about it? You know? Good. Yeah. I, I, well, go ahead, Ken. Go ahead, yeah, Catherine. I, I think, you know, um, I mean, now that I sit here, I mean, I'm, I'm so sorry about this background, right? But it's the, it's the, um, it's the reality. And one of the things I realize talking to people is that they don't understand what we mean with targeting. They have no idea because targeting sounds like, ooh, you know, it's like someone just, I don't know, has got a, you know, a, a crosshair, you know, on a screen as you're walking around. That's targeting. This is not what we mean. So just explain to you my, my every day because I have been targeted as in I would say mutilated and I, I know that you know I'm not criticizing Ramola's term because we had a long discussion about the vocabulary to use. I'll now just briefly summarize what my life has been like and for example today and yesterday. Um, so in January 2016 I started to be openly mutilated with these things and I mean mutilated. The idea is to cause as much harm as they remotely can possibly can. So I started having intense shots of microwaves pulsed into me that are so intense it hurts, right? So someone has to think, hang on, you know, we don't have an experience of microwaves apart from our own microwave in the kitchen. So imagine you take that energy, you put it into the pulse, in, into a pulse, and you shoot it into a person's body. What you're gonna do is, you know, localize cooking and tissue damage. And essentially, I have been shot into on purpose in my home for the past year, nonstop, not just once or 16 times per day, which would have been bad enough, but about two dozen times at least per hour, at least. And that's just the shots, random body parts. Then they cook my head. And this is why I need to have these shielding panels because I know that there's a microwave emitter because when I sit at my desk, the back of my head is cooked to the point where I can't think. If this thing isn't there and if this device isn't off, I can't sit here and work. And all this for the, the listeners who don't know anything about microwaves, it's all based on the fact that if you've got microwaves, 50% pass through 
normal building materials. So you can have a brick wall, you can have concrete, you know, if it's the normal thickness, 50% is going to go through. So if you double the intensity, you can have, you can microwave somebody on the other side of a wall. You can focus the microwaves into a sharp pencil beam. You can pulse it, anything. And that's what the intelligence agencies did. They used the 40 years of classification and cover-up to build up an entire arsenal of stealth weaponry. They already merged. They are one big corporation. So it's not to, you know, to apply stealth weapons against the KGB or something. It's not. It's to apply it against us because it's this internal criminal cartel that, by the way, isn't productive in the least because they are not an actual productive jobs. I'm sorry, banking isn't productive. They were generating money out of thin air. They didn't produce anything. Intelligence isn't productive per se, unless you really try to analyze and you know, protect your country. But by now, most systems don't do that. And they got rid of everybody who actually did, like Karen. That's why she's an inside the system, because her services were deadly, you know, actual analysis in the system. So we have now the, the real face of the intelligence agencies, which is about destruction, you know. And we have also the military, which is by definition about destruction. So we've got a, this huge system, which is entirely, um, you know, based around destruction. That's the only business that they're in. And they're using this stealth weaponry to continue destruction and try to make money out of destruction. And at first, the business plan works. But as Ramola said, they're not creating wealth. They're just, they think they create wealth. They're destroying everybody. And now the actual the thing is that, you know, they just mutilate you more and more. So they start mutilating you because that's their business plan. If you speak up trying to protect you, then they mutilate you even more because you spoke up. Then because the attacks increased, you're trying to protect yourself. Then they mutilate you even harder because you try to protect yourself. And it's like a, an endless ratchet. So by now, for example, yesterday, I went to bed well, the day before yesterday. I went to bed, I think about 3.30 a.m. I climbed into bed. And I have to erect these shielding panels in a triangle, having stuff below me, stuff around me, and then crawl in, then have a metal, solid cast iron metal pan to just keep it near my head. If there are any gaps in the shielding, the computer will scan it, shoot through, and it will bounce around inside and hit me. So I crawled in, and then they didn't start with the electromagnetic attacks. They started vibrating the entire area. So try sleeping when your entire body is being vibrated with military technology. Okay, that lasted 20 minutes. They got bored. Then they started muscle pulsing me. And I have no idea how they do that. If they actually read my brain, you know, um, EG, and they are making my brain do these spasms. But they literally just start with just moving your hand against your um, will. Then you try to ignore it. You try to sleep. Then suddenly your shoulder jerks. And I don't know if it's because an electromagnetic pulse was shot into it or because of something else. That continues for another half, um, half an hour. By that time, it's about 4.30 a.m., you know. And then when they're bored with that and they realize, okay, I still just didn't react, they turn on the machine, the microwave machine guns and just shoot me to bits. And that's what the metal cast iron is for because when they start shooting at these panels, these panels are okay. At the smallest gap between the panels, they shoot through, it bounces around, and when it's shot into your body, it is like a shot. And when, when I put the metal pan to just try to protect my face, sleeping in a bunker, curled up like a Jew in hiding in the Second World War in Zurich, not Basra, in my bedroom, they shoot me to bits such that when I try to protect my face and my head with this cast iron pan, I can hear the shots bouncing off the cast iron. And we had a discussion, all three of us, you know, Karen, Ramol, and I, we all heard the shots. Mm -hmm. They bounce off this aluminium yeah. and you can hear it go. Yeah. Very fine, very fine shots. The amount of electromagnetic energy that has to go into that is mm -hmm. stupendous. Yeah, it is horrific. And what these people do is that they start utterly shooting at us. Mm -hmm. That was how I, you know, lasted throughout the night. And then all you can do is have extra layers of aluminium. I've got bits and pieces. This I had to use to just protect my kidney just now sitting here. I've got extra bits here 
to protect my knees. And you have to, sitting at my desk, I have to sit here, occasionally protect my knee, and I've got about, I think, eight layers just for my knee. Because as I'm sitting at my own desk in my own home in Zurich, they will try to demolish my knee. Yes. yes. So, and this is how, this was me trying to sleep. So then at something like 5.30 a.m., you know, the artillery barrage stopped. I couldn't sleep. I received not just two dozen soft shots into my body, endless number, endless number. And then at some point around 6 a.m., I managed to fall asleep. And that repeats every night and has done so for a year. And then when you get up, you crawl out, you try to network with, with people. I'm trying to work with um, Ramola and Karen. You know, we're trying to put stuff together. And then our emails get hacked, emails disappear, or I get false emails. I get mailer daemon messages that cannot be true. You know, the messages do arrive. When I try to update, we, we established a life size, um, life sign monitor. I couldn't update it because when I log into WordPress, it, it slows down to a crawl. So if I type a sentence, it takes 20 seconds to appear. Now try working with that. Yeah. And I tried everything, you know. They've done the same thing to me on WordPress. Yeah, it's shocking. Yeah. I'm totally packed in real time, so the computer totally freezes. Exactly. You know, despite the fact that I'm trying to shield the laptop as I'm writing, um, yeah. it doesn't help. And, and then, you We've know, been, this, this, this is the, so, so just to finish off, because, you know, you've got the daytime, the, the nighttime, and then the daytime, and anything you try to do, they will try to obliterate it and then you get emails from agents mocking you. I got fake emails just recently um, saying, oh, it, it claimed to be a legal company sending me adverts saying, you know, what do you do if you um, essentially become disabled and can't, can't take care of yourself? So it was kind of like a living will thing, suggesting I should write my living will. And I never, this company doesn't have my email, but it's always timed. And then, of course, we get, you know, time messages. People comment on our emails. People mm -hmm. comment on the emails we send and receive. Yeah. And I have published on my website a very high-profile case where someone quoted a sentence that I sent to somebody else. And this keeps going. You try to get through. When you try to call lawyers, they don't want to hear. They don't want anything to do with it. When you're trying to go to the police, they don't record it. Mm -hmm. I try to go, I try to get my case reports from Greater Manchester Police. They refuse to send it. They refuse to answer my emails. I, I emailed the High Court, I think a dozen times, requesting the inf the evidence I had sent to them, on re requesting confirmation, and also asking them why my case is not in the searchable database on mine. They refuse to reply. So we're essentially entirely surrounded. Cut mm -hmm. off from communication. Our communications are, you know, truncated. There are also slander campaigns over mm -hmm. and over of really weird stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, we get agents mocking us. Meanwhile, whilst we're trying to update WordPress, our joints are crippled with a nonstop barrage. And then they've got frequencies where literally they just turn it on. It's like a switch. They turn it on. And then within a second, it feels like your head is burning up from the inside. It's a sensation I never had before in my life. Never. And it's external because you can shield from it and you can actually record it. Yeah. You know, exactly. even with a microwave smog detector. Yeah. So when, when people turn to you and say, aren't you imagining this? Isn't this in your head? Aren't you being a little paranoid about ambient EMF? This is not ambient EMF. This is very deliberately pulsed EMF that is targeted and directed directly at you and that can be recorded audibly on shielding and on a meter. You know, and I, I think we've all had that, ex we've all had that experience. I, as you say, um, Catherine, at night, I also have to surround myself with shielding and I use Reflectix, this kind of metallic bubble wrap stuff, which mm -hmm. kind of looks like this. And inside, it's, this is actually two layers, and inside there's sheet metal. Wow. So I'm surrounded with this sheet metal covered reflectix all around me and over my head. Plus, I've got these mini shields that I make that I kind of prop up against my body because I'm hit very close. 
something they like to do every single night is hit my heart. Yes. They, you know, so they seem to think as soon as let's get her prone and then try to finish her off. So it's heart hit. And I'm and I'm using loaf bands, like Teflon covered loaf bands against my heart and this shield, you know, several layers of pans of, of metal to, to ward off these blows, which I can hear, which are very audible, you know. And of course, when I try to get up and I try to record it, they mess with my cell phone, so it, it doesn't work. So I haven't been able to record these particular things, but I'm going to keep trying and I'm also going to go get some better equipment so I can do it without a cell phone, I think. Um, because this has been going on for so long and they hit the shielding so loudly you can hear the hits. And I frequently actually asked my husband to, because now, of course, I'm sleeping in my own room and sleeping in my, in my book room, in my library, what used to be my library. It's, it's, it's got all my books. And now it's got me in my little twin beds sleeping there with my shielding. And I frequently ask my husband, just come in and stay up, wait till I fall asleep and listen to the sounds. Well, he tends to fall asleep before I do. And so this has actually never happened in the last three years. <laughs> so he, has, he can't actually witness to this. But I can tell you that my daughter has witnessed, has heard, and has, she doesn't want to talk about it. She's 12 years old. She doesn't want to talk about it, but she has definitely witnessed this kind of incredible hitting on the shielding around me. So, you know, what I wanted to say was, this is horrific, What you just kind of, the, the picture you painted is so horrific. And I'm sure Karen also has her own stories as well, right? And talks about very similar, awful. very similar. Yeah. Yeah, how horrific it is both at night. And you know, in, in your case, Catherine, it almost sounds like they're hitting you nonstop through the, through the entire night. And that's just mind boggling to me. It seems like in my case, they hit, 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 and then they stop or they taper off or I fall asleep. I don't know why, but I get woken up like three to five times a night with all sorts of things, you know, noises on the shielding, hits, extreme microwave heat sprinkling down on me um, or heat at, at my spine where I'm lying, you know, so I'm forced to wake up. All sorts of things. And then the same things you mentioned, the vibrating of the bed, vibrating of your body, shocks, electromuscular shocks all over your body. And I don't know how they do that. This is, this is their wonderful classified tech, right? Remote um, electrical stimulation, which, by the way, talking about time periods, was something that was discovered by neuroscientists and biologists many many decades ago. There's, in fact, I was just before this conversation, I was looking up a 1930s paper on the remote electrical stimulation of the nervous system. So a lot of research was done and then it was all buried and it went underground and it went into the intelligence agencies and went into the CIA and it went into the military and it emerged as bio effects of selected non-lethal weapons, kept classified, you know. so. So there's all this awful stuff that's happening to us at night. And then in the daytime, I'm actually hit nonstop during the day, even as I'm sitting here right now, I'm being hit in the face. And as you say, I'm being hit in the organs all around. And I'm just partially shielded because like you, I like to breathe and I like to look out and look at the sun, you know, so I'm not covering myself in a box and I'm not walking around with stuff all over my head, which I do sometimes to protect myself. But I think, I think what it comes down to is we are being hit so extremely and in some of our cases for such a very long time i have been hit in these exact ways for three years now you know every single night sleep deprived and my eyes I've, I've aged like 40 years i think over the last three years i used to have a life i used to have an athletic um you know outdoorsy kind of life i used to go on long walks i used to go hiking i used to go running i used to go to the gym now i'm hit whenever i go outside particularly when I'm running or walking or going to the gym. I'm hit at the heart and I'm hit in my private births. And another thing they love to do is induce incontinence, which I have discovered is nothing but a weapon that's doing it because it can be shielded from. And I've learned how to shield from it. But it's very hard to exercise being shielded. <laughs> can you imagine wearing organite and a ton of metal shielding all over your body and trying to exercise and do yoga? I can't go to a yoga class anymore. And I once thought that in my 50s, I would teach yoga. Well, I can't even go to a yoga class to go and you know do downward dog on my mat with anybody else. So 
it's like when I do yoga at home nowadays, which I have to tell myself to do because it's a huge production, I have to shield the entire room and try to shield in front of the TV as well and turn the TV on and watch a show and do yoga, you know? So our lives have been so thoroughly invaded, have been so thoroughly intruded upon, have been so thoroughly destroyed that I think the first step in trying to, in trying to attack this because we are being attacked is to say, this is unconscionable. This is unacceptable, you know? This is untenable. We cannot sit back and accept it. So we take that first step and we say that we cannot accept this. We will not accept this, you know? I, I think it's, even, sorry, forgive me. It's even more than that because you put it so nicely, you know? It's like everything you say is true but it doesn't even do it justice to what's happening because this is a death camp experiment. This is Auschwitz. Yeah. We are in Auschwitz. So everybody listening to this, they are having a video recording from Auschwitz and from Dachau live mm -hmm. and Bergen-Belsen, right? This is it. This is the 21st um, century version. You know, all three of us mm -hmm. are in different death camps. Yeah. And what we have is that the intelligence agencies used this classification period to keep people in the dark about this technology. And they are now going out and they're shooting women to pieces in their bedrooms for fun. For fun. They don't need to test this technology because they can predict the effects very accurately. They are now out mutilating us to death for fun. We're not a threat to the cartel. We're just being shot up because they can. And that's exactly right. You know, it starts out with sort of, um, you know, pronouncing the death threat on us, calling us, calling us dangerous, calling us enemies of the state. And these are just labels. Obviously, we are nothing of the sort. We're just smart people who speak out. We've been labeled and a lethal mechanism has been applied to us, you know. And these so-called non-lethal weapons are not non-lethal. No. The, the, the way in which they're being used as well is supremely lethal. Nobody, I mean, the program that is, that is being uh, directed at us is insane in every possible way. 24-7 assault with deadly microwave weapons and deadly neuro weapons, you know, directed at both our brains and our bodies. 24-7 assault, every single second being shot? I mean, in what world can we even call that sane? Even as a weapon of war, it's not sane. No, it's horrific. And that's why they, they used the uh, microwave in Iraq secretly, because the Geneva Convention would never condone it. It's cruel and unusual to dehydrate mm -hmm. someone, to burn them up on the spot. Mm -hmm. um, I, I have spoken with uh, David Galbots, who is military intelligence, and, and some of his career he spent actually guarding the facilities where they did some of the uh, some of this research. And very unfortunately, uh, he described to me that this military facility would go out and get dogs from the neighborhood or dogs from the shelter, bring them in, and then murder them with these weapons to see how the weapons worked. You know, so um, that was horrific to hear. But he also said that he saw uh, 60 Minutes, where the 60 Minutes uh, reporter, are you hearing me? Okay. Yeah. Uh, but where the 60 Minutes reporter interviewed a general from the Pentagon, and the general was saying, oh, we have non-lethal weapons because this will stop people from doing whatever, and it won't harm them. And G David said he was outraged because there is no such thing as a non-lethal weapon in the directed oh. energy family because they were always meant to be lethal. It's just how long do you use it on someone? Because it mm -hmm. has lethality and is mm -hmm. meant to be. It this was designed to be lethal. Now what they do is they go back on the, the strength of it and say that it's non-lethal. No, it is eventually lethal. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. it takes maybe a little bit of force, but a long time or it takes a lot of force and a very little uh, about, amount of time, but they were always intended to be lethal. So that is absolute baloney. And they are giving these weapons to the police yes. and telling them they're non-lethal. Yeah. It's a lie. 
Yeah, and that's exactly what Lynn Sagala of the U.S. Psychotronics Association also has noted um, in that letter that she has, you know, given people to use as testimony because she worked for Lockheed Martin. And so she's really an insider whistleblower. And she said the same thing. There's no such thing as a non-lethal weapon. Every single one of these, the masers, the lasers, the microwave weapons, they're all lethal. And as you say, Karen, it's just a matter of intensity. But even with that lower intensity, well, look I mean, at the, their state, their state troopers who are now getting uh, cancer from using radar guns. Oh, that's correct. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, and as you say, they are using these weapons to dehydrate people. You know, so a weapon being hit at your face, you know, continually all the time, it dehydrates you, it dehydrates your skin, it burns up your cells, and it starts creating illness in your body. It starts creating inflammation and illness in your body um, on a continuous basis. And so that continuous usage is lethal. And so I think... It's one of the things see. you know one of the things we need to do as we as we figure out how to deal with this is to recognize how outrageous these weapons are you know and once we take that on board once we understand that essentially these are systems of torture that are being applied to us and these are weapons these are military grade weapons that are inherently inflicting cruel and unusual pun punishment that would be against any of the international conventions and treaties, against all of the you know, universal declaration of human rights that we have in the world today. We take that information and we put it forward in front of the right people, you know, and we, and we repeat this information until people get it. Because un unfortunately, we are living in a kind of a handicapped world where media has failed us. You know, mainstream media has failed us. Yeah. Now it kind of falls upon us to be media and to be the informers, both. You know, we are not just the witnesses who are living inside the death camps. We also have to be the photographers, you know, who convey the first pictures. That, that's exactly oh. right. I, I want to uh, jump in here because we must have really passed right over the target. Soon as uh, Karen started talking about microwaving the dogs, they cut us out. Oh, oh wow! They don't, we, they don't want to. They don't want that information out. Whatever it was, whatever you talked about, we couldn't hear it because it had cut out. But, okay. Well, I'll, I'll repeat very quickly. Yeah. I Please. have been I have been in touch with David Galbots, who was military intelligence, and one of his assignments was to guard facilities where they were doing. Uh, uh, weapons testing and this is you know a couple decades ago and so he said that after dark the military facility would bring in truckloads of dogs either stolen from neighborhoods or gotten at the shelter bring them in and test the weapons on them killing them frying them in the most inhumane way possible and uh, so he said that he knew that this, these weapons were not non-lethal. And he saw a episode of 60 Minutes where a reporter interviewed a general from the Pentagon about non-lethal weapons. Well, the general lied bold faced to the reporter saying, oh, these are humane weapons. You know, these are just to, for crowd control and just to push people back so we don't have to kill them. Yeah. And he, <clears throat> excuse me, he was so outraged that he contacted 60 Minutes and said, that's a lie. And I will do an interview with you and tell you exactly the fact that these were always designed to be lethal. It's just a matter of the intensity of their usage. You can use them at a low level over a long period of time and kill someone, or you can use them at a high level, a high strength uh, in a short amount of time and kill them, but they're meant to kill. Right. So that was the point. That was the point. That's really great. And I, and I want to go back to what Ramola was saying, that we have no media. There is no media taking up for humanity. Yeah. Uh, maybe a little alternative media through the internet, uh, mm -hmm. trying to do all we can. I think in terms of solutions, the first thing we need to do, 
the reason we assembled this together, and I don't know whose idea it was, maybe Ms. Catherine's idea to get people together. We've got three very credible uh, people that are being hit by these, uh, this asymmetric warfare. And I think these podcasts need to get out. They need to get legs. People need to hear this because when, when you three are talking together about the same thing, you add credibility to one another. This is actually happening. Um, and you are motivating people to contact us. We uh, forwarded to Catherine a, a video that somebody made in the middle of Switzerland. This guy just got on. I'm sure this is the first time he ever did anything on YouTube. And he made a video appealing to people to write. Uh, they were going to write the UN on behalf of Ka of Catherine. Did you see that, Catherine? Yes, I did. And I'm, I'm really, really grateful for that because um, I think what people have to understand is that, um, you know, this is why I went into such great detail explaining my day. It's because, um, you know, I think in the discussion, we're still falling back to trying to explain to people that these weapons exist and so on and trying to convince them. We, we're way past them. This system is now essentially a dead. These, these psychopaths in the intelligence agencies are not doing anything productive. They're not creating wealth. They are out to satisfy their own psychopathology. And they are mutilating us to death. These are death camp experiments. So the intelligence agencies have now launched active death camps mm -hmm. okay so exactly. we have got death camps operational we have the gestapo and we've got death camps what mm -hmm. do we do and what i yeah. tried to do i tried to go to the police they ignored me they tried to smear me as mental health the military police tried to assassinate me they tried to assassinate me on the serpentines that was just a couple of weeks ago in january you know on the 23rd of january i almost died in the serpentines outside Davos because they shot me into the back of the head from, I don't know, either the forest or the van behind, but I just passed a military police vehicle that was ostentatiously parked in the, in the street. These people are beyond common sense. They are out to kill. They are out to kill and mutilate with bravado. So when the intelligence agencies and the military have become so degenerate, we have the Gestapo. How do you stop the Gestapo? It takes the police, it takes the courts, and it takes every single institution we have in the land, all of them. And just last week, I went to talk to the military, the military HQ saying, guys, if, you're, if you are running death camps in your, in your own country, your own bloody self, you morons, what you're advertising is that you're about to be invaded because there's not been a country on planet Earth that ran death camp experiments that wasn't invaded by a foreign power just doesn't exist they had them you know they had the death squads in latin america because it was the cia invading them essentially they had them in poland because germany was invading poland so if we've got death camps here in switzerland it means someone's coming they're already here but they will be here officially very soon does the Swiss military care? No, because Mr. Pretty Face wanted to check himself out in the mirror. That was his highest priority. The, the guy needs to get the sack, but an awful lot of people as well. And then the same week I go and I try to get through to the German embassy as a German citizen. And this is what happened. I go the first time, I'm shot to pieces. And then I lose my way in Bern and I don't make it because the embassy closes surprisingly early. Okay, I come back the next day. The person whom I begged for help, it, I think just before Christmas, refused to reply to my contact request for the last couple of months. This is the German embassy in Bern. I'm a German citizen. No reply from the embassy. And then I go there in person. That day, they don't have time for me because they're all in a meeting. Okay. And I ask, is she there next day? Yes, she will be. Okay, I come the next day. And the next day, she already left home early. She left home early. I wasn't told the day before when I came. And I thought, that's nonsense. And it was in my anger that I went to the military HQ in Switzerland because I had my bundle and I gave that to the, to the NDB guy. So the NDB now has my file. So any mutilation that's happening to me is on the book, the watch of the NDB officially. They are officially culpable, officially liable. But then listen to this. On Thursday, right, 
we had our, um, you know, our first crime fighters, techno crime fighters um, forum. Um, and then before that, I was trying to call the German embassy and I call and there's a, a computerized, um, you know, automated message in, um, you know, in the beginning. And it says the embassy is closed today. I thought that's interesting because it doesn't show up in the public holidays. And the computer announced the same voice. So it was the embassy machine saying, the, you know, embassy is closed today. That's interesting. So I didn't call them. On Friday, I called back. The machine said the same thing. The embassy is closed today. And I looked on the embassy website. That's burn.diplo.de, right? It lists all the public holidays. These two days are not listed. So I thought, that's it. I'm now calling the emergency mobile phone of the embassy. And I called. Of course, you just get through to an answer machine. And they never reply. You know, I left my message that day. I was utterly shot to bits, you know, because of our forum discussion the day before. And then I wait and wait. And I thought, I'll just try again. And this time, I'll record the embassy message. And as I'm, you know, I, I get out my recorder, I put it in and I phone. And of course, they can see me. They're watching me 24-7. So they know now she's going to record the message. And then I get through to the um, porter. And I say, aren't you closed today? He said, no. Were, were you closed yesterday? No, we were here. So what is this? This was the manipulation of the embassy message. So someone sabotaged the embassy message between me on my Swiss landline as a German citizen trying to contact the German embassy. Now that's already foreign interference or it's sabotage, right? It gets even better than that because I hear that. And then I say, oh, you know, can I talk to Miss Richter? Oh no, sorry, because Miss Richter is ill. So that week I had it all. Miss Richter was in a meeting. Miss Richter left home early on a, a two o'clock on a Wednesday. She was already home. And then by Friday she was ill. I thought, what am I going to hear on Monday? That she got kidnapped by aliens? You know? <laughs> and then I log into the router thinking, hang on, did they hack my router? Did the message, is there something funny with my router or was it on their end? I log into my router and I see, and the telephone, just like now, is next to me here. And then I see that on the router, there are two mobile phone calls. And the phone wasn't active when the call came. And it is the embassy mobile phone. They did call back twice, but my phone didn't ring. Mm. So what is this? This, mm. is, this is sabotaging a national citizen's access to their own national embassy. Now, under international law, that's already, I think, you know, getting towards an act of war because you are. This is warfare. So mm. who is doing it? You know, I mean, this is insane. And then on Monday, and this is now the final thing, on Monday, I finally get through. And I get passed from Miss Richter, who was my case um, person, to some uh, uh, Miss Ursula Braumann. And I want the world to remember that name. Mm -hmm. Ursula Braumann at the German embassy in Bern. I talk to her and I say, look, I'm, I'm calling about my case. And she says, oh, yeah, yeah, don't have to tell me because I'm very familiar with your case. I, I you know, I've, I've tried to get through to the embassy several times. I think like half a dozen of times in writing over the past year. And then she says, oh, well, I'm sorry, but we can't help you. And I say, but you haven't even tried anything. You haven't tried to help me. And um, you know, I said, look, you said to me, I have to go through the um, legal system here in Switzerland. I tried to talk to the police. They refused. I tried to talk to the criminal police. They refused. I tried to talk to the military police. Have to stop. They tried to assassinate me. Okay. They actually tried to assassinate me ostentatiously. Okay. I tried to talk to the attorney general. And this case, they don't want to deal with this. I now talked last week, you know, to the to it's a Swiss intelligence agent who, by his own statement, was senior. I got it continued. I'm still being shot up. So I went through absolutely every instance in this country. Are you going to help a German citizen who's being mutilated to death and murdered and has three assassination attempts survived in this foreign country? As a German citizen, are you going to try to help me? They're like, no, sorry, we can't help you. We can't help you. And then I said, but I, you said I have to go through the legal system here. I did. I've, I've got even the letter of a lawyer saying you have now exhausted all possibilities. I say, do we have now a situation where I just have to resign myself to the fact that I'm being mutilated to death? And 
Miss Ursula Braumann of the German embassy says to a German citizen, well, you just have to resign yourself to that. Oh my goodness. <laughs> These are Nazi experiments. These are Nazi death camps. So this woman is a Nazi collaborator. I want everybody, I want this to go down in history. And so is Dr. Otto Lampe. He's a Nazi collaborator because he refused to even try. I said to Ms. Baumann, well, at least, you know, if, if the German ambassador calls the police and says, sorry, could you just inform me what's going on? Just inform me. I'm not going to interfere. Just tell me what's going on. That's going to make a difference. That makes a difference. But they're not willing to do that because there's an agreement that this death camp experiment will be run and we are to be exterminated. That's the thing. We are. There is an agreement between people that we are to be exterminated. And the people who agree are police officers, attorney generals, ambassadors, judges, and military police officers and military and intelligence leadership. Mm -hmm. They have agreed. So now the only question is, who the hell are the Nazis? We have to find the Nazis. We have to stop the Nazis. That's the only thing. And I can say, I'm, you know, the Swiss NDB, they are for sure Nazis. I've now got proof for that. Ms. Ursula Braumann is a Nazi collaborator, and so is Dr. Otto Lampe. Because this is egregious. This is like a world mm -hmm. coming. Yes, and I think the point that you're making to name the Nazi collaborators is a huge first step. Because I think, as you say, somebody has made an agreement to exterminate us. Somebody has held hands, has signed off verbally, orally, or it's through written means, who knows. But they have decided it's okay. It's okay to take these names and put them on the kill list. It's okay to put them on the extermination list. And from that point onward, these names are, you know, it's a free for all. You can go ahead and test weapons on these people. You can go ahead and uh, play with your neurotechnology research projects on these people, whether you're DARPA or MIT or whoever. You can go ahead and um, use and um, take out insurance policies on these people. And you can go ahead and bring out your gangs of gang stalkers. Every way um, you're torturing them. It's a money-making deal. Mm -hmm. It's a money-making deal. You can collect money on these people, and this money is going to come from federal grants. You see, that's the way it works in the U.S. over here. There's a lot of federal grant money going around. And I think both Karen and I can, can corroborate what you were saying, Catherine, with who we've approached for answers and the kind of non-answers we've gotten. You know, I spent a lot of time the last three years doing FOIA requests to various agencies, the CIA, the FBI, even the US Secret Service, the DIA, the DHS, you name it. I've put out so many FOIA requests and also locally in Massachusetts, you know, the Massachusetts Fusion Center and so forth. And the answers I get back from the intelligence agencies are, we can't tell you if you are being investigated because we claim section five or some exemption whereby we are permitted not to tell you anything. National you're security. Just a, yes, you're a citizen and we are engaged in national security. So if you are being investigated, that's an issue of national security to tell you. Or, to tell you. So we are not telling you. This is so absurd. And then uh, DHS, you know, I was talking. No, the it's unconstitutional. Yeah, the Fourth Amendment says you have a right to know what you're being accused of. Why? So you can defend yourself against falsehood. Mm -hmm. Yes. And it's in their best interest to let you know so you can present a defense so you don't waste months or years of resources researching someone who said, oh, here's the proof that I didn't do that right here. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So there is no way that a law-abiding citizen of the United States can reach out and say and ask, why am I being investigated? Why am I being surveilled? Why are police following me? Why, why am I being hit with microwave weapons? You know, and if you look at our cases, uh, you know, getting back to the personal, it's like, I, I'm a writer. I've been teaching art classes and creative writing classes. What did you, why do, did I suddenly come under surveillance, for what reason? I have nothing to do with 
terrorism. I, I have no connections with any terrorist organizations. Yet all of a sudden, there are people surrounding me calling me a terrorist. I mean, this actually happened to me playing, you know, taking my daughter to a local park. Um, women suddenly throwing out words, terrorist. And on another occasion, you know, this was even more hostile, women shouting guillotine to me. Uh, so it's, it's, it's all ridiculous. So in any case, but there's no way in which we can actually approach these so-called authorities and find out why we are under investigation or under surveillance. And one of the things that I did, in fact, was I asked DHS, this is the Department of Homeland Security, um, what exactly is the story behind the cars that are going up and down my block from the time this targeting started three years ago? There've been cars going up and down my block and in tandem when they're going up and down the block and parking, then I feel hits on my body, you know, microwave hits on my body. It's almost like they go up the block, park and hit diagonally. And if I change my room, if I move to the next room, they go around the block, park again and hit diagonally. So, and, and then they started parking in neighbors' houses and neighbors' drivers. So I asked uh, Homeland Security, can you give me all of the correspondence between, you know, the, and I named the neighbors, you know, I named the houses in which they lived, and I said between this person and, and DHS, because uh, I don't understand why these cars are parking. These are externally originating cars. They are zooming up and down, and they are acting in a very peculiar fashion. There is a pattern in which they are moving around the block. And then they also engage in shift action. You know, after uh, a period of time, maybe a couple hours, a new bout, you know, covey of cars comes into the block. So I asked them, what, what is this all about? And the, you know the answer I get back from the Department of Homeland Security? They say, no responsive documents, and that's it. Here they're being told about clearly terrorist action in my neighborhood of cars zooming in and zooming out. They don't care. They just don't care. And this is supposedly homeland security, you know? So it's just like your experience, Catherine. It's like these so-called authorities are obviously collaborative, collaborators in this entire scenario. They are complicit and they are engaging in this. They are engaging in this activity. So, so I think, what do we do? What do we do in such a scenario? So I think one of the things we do is do exactly what you have done, which is name them to the extent that you have their names name them call the nazi collaborators do it publicly do it on video do it in writing put it on the internet you know and the other thing i really want to call out is uh, human rights groups that we have approached who have utterly failed us and journalists we have approached who have utterly failed us yes. name them you know every one of us who's been hit has run to the aclu we have written innumerable letters. We have knocked on their doors. I have actually gone in person to the ACLU Massachusetts in Boston. I've gone there and said, look, this is happening. You know, I've, I'm being co clearly covertly harassed. And the people in front at the front desk of ACLU Massachusetts laughed at me. They laughed at me. They laughed when I said I am being hit with electromagnetic weapons. These are, ex and I always use the words external signals. This must be my physics background, you know. I have an undergraduate in physics. Um, I know Catherine is a physicist, but it's like I always mention these are external signals. Yeah. These are not my imagination and it's not ambient EMF. It, these are deliberate directional external pulsed electromagnetic signals that I'm registering on parts of my body. I am being hit with microwave weaponry. So I use all this language and I say this to them and they laugh at me and then they pull out their form and say, okay, fill it out. Yeah. You know, and the form says, the form has a line that says, what do you expect the ACLU to do for you? You know, not, not a question like, what's going on? Are you experiencing some kind of abrogation of your civil rights or your human yeah. rights? Tell us about it. Yeah. No, what do you expect us to do for you? Well, okay, so I filled out the form. I left all my information with them and I get, I get a message a week later, a letter from them saying, we received your information. I'm afraid we can't help you because you're an individual. See, this is it. This is exactly it. <sighs> and this is where I actually, one thing that I've just thought about, 
I have recorded all the conversations with these officials that I'm referring to. And I have, you know, passed around background copies. So should anything happen to me, they have to go literally up public and, you know, for Nuremberg 2.0. But I was thinking, and I was talking to Melanie Richan, and she pointed out that actually we're now in the realm of legitimate self-defense. We are being mutilated to death on purpose. And things that might be illegal or unlawful otherwise do not uphold. So this thing of, oh, you're not allowed to record covertly, people covertly, doesn't hold. It already doesn't hold for journalists. You know, they have done sting operations where they co covertly recorded people and then leaked stuff like that when it's about egregious crimes. And I think we should do the same thing. I think we should start and we should record the phone conversations because yeah. I have now, I've recorded Miss Ursula Braumann and I will make it public because that is essentially a crime. But also I can, you know, now confirm that I have contacted Private Eye is a, is a magazine that comes out every two weeks. And it's one of these, you know, I, it's got lots of whistleblower material. I didn't just contact them. I was in their office for I think half an hour, over half an hour, begging them to allow them to leave my court bundle. I just, after my second court hearing from the high court, after I already survived one assassination attempt by MI5 or MI6, I went to Private Eye, one of the you know, most well-known um, um, newspapers or magazines in the UK. I'm in their offices and the person who told me that this thing happened with Joe Cox, the, you know, the, the, this person stabbed someone and there was this big hoo-ha about the MP parliamentarian, Joe Cox. I got to know that from Jane McKenzie, who was sitting downstairs in the private eye office. And I'm begging them to just report about the maiming and mutilation of UK citizens and about the severe, you know, egregious um, um, perversion of the course of justice. They couldn't be asked. They couldn't wait to get me out of the building as quickly as possible. And one of the ladies slipped out when she answered the phone. There was a writer's meeting upstairs. So the entire assembly of journalists, that was on the 16th of June, 2016, was upstairs above me, a flight of stairs removed. And the, the, the two ladies downstairs were extremely keen to get me out the door before anybody from upstairs comes downstairs. But that was private eye. But I did leave my bundle. I got it back with thanks from Jane McKenzie saying, sorry, we can't help you. Private eye, no, have this information. They are Nazi collaborators. I'm sorry. These are death camp experiments. They've been running for decades. We know that hundreds of thousands of people are affected. There's no way that in, in the UK, you've got five or six mainstream newspapers. There's no way they don't know. Another one, Luke Harding. He was there at the high court case where my targeting started. I sat next to the guy for weeks. I phoned him. He gave me my business card. I phoned him and I told him about this harassment. He couldn't care less. I said, look, this is bigger than the Snowden stuff. This is people actually being mutilated, not just spied upon. The, the, the information that you guys reported on this prolific spying system is now being used for prolific murder. Do you care? Luke Harding couldn't care less. The only thing he asked me is, um, what nationality are you? And that was one of my harassment triggers. That's what MI5 harassed me with by just having random people stop and ask me for my nationality. And it comes from Luke Harding. So I'm thinking, Luke, you don't get it. You will go down in history as a Nazi collaborator, my friend. That's the thing. And, you know, we mentioned so many other journalists and we should call it out. I mean, I have contacted all major newspapers in Germany and in the UK, and they are all Nazi collaborators. Why? Because I think the intelligence agencies are actually Nazi organizations. I think this is what we're waking up to. And most of the journalists are agents. So, of course, they'll be collaborating gladly in a, in a paid way with Nazi crimes being committed. That's the truth, as shocking as it might sound. That is the truth. Yeah, I think there are two or three scenarios actually offer. One of them is... Say it again, it just broke up. Forgive me. Yeah, that's all right, something happened. My voice has been broken. Yeah. Now it's okay. It's okay now? Okay, excellent. So I think there's one or two, three, two or three scenarios c currently operating. One of them is precisely what you say. There are intel agencies 
situated inside the major newspapers. So the people you think are journalists are actually intelligence. They are totally working for the CIA. So they don't care. They're the ones who absolutely don't care. And in fact, they, they not only don't care, they are brazen and inhuman because they will laugh at you. And I've had various experiences of people, you know, just not responding. And that's the other aspect. You know, there are journalists who are working for these big newspapers, for the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Chicago Tribune, the Guardian, the Independent, and so forth. Um, and some of them, of course, are even running independent organizations, like The Intercept, right, and, and others, that have a profile as being questioning journalists, as being investigative journalists, as being somewhat um, critical of the government. And therefore, you would think more open to hearing from us. And yet, many of us have written to these precise journalists and got, gotten absolutely nowhere. Yeah. You know, I, I wrote to I wrote to the usual gamut. I mean, I went through, I wrote to John Pilger, I wrote to Glenn Greenwald, I wrote to Trevor Tim, I wrote to Jeremy Scahill, to Peter Moss, various people from, you know, The Guardian, The Intercept, um, and so forth. And I didn't get back any response. At one point, I think Trevor Tim wrote back to me saying, Ramola, um, you have, you have an, an attachment. What I had done was I had written down the whole scenario behind what was happening to me, plus my own analysis of what I felt was happening generally to those being targeted. I put it in a, in a letter and I attached it and sent it to these journalists. And this one journalist said to me, well, I don't get your, you know, I can't open attachments because I don't know you. So I took the whole thing, put it in an email and sent it to him, you know, I pasted it in and he didn't respond after that. And this is, um, you know, he's the head of, I forget what his organization is called. It's something called Freedom of the Press Foundation or something. And I think Snowden is involved with it as well. So it's like freedom of the press and you don't really care when a writer writes to you. I am a writer yeah. and I am writing to you and I am telling you what is happening to me. I am an American writer who is being assaulted with microwave weapons. Do you not care? Yeah, we're all those particular individuals. I've been following for a long time, and they have shown to be anything but impartial, actual journalists. I mean, if you talk about Greenwald, he's in with the, he, he, he sold his soul to the guy who owns PayPal. Uh, Jeremy Scahill, he works yeah. for, for Pacifica, which is part of the Tavistock. You know, it's, they're, all, oh. they're all Nazis. I mean, they're all on the same side. I want, before we go, I'm going to have you. Uh, I'd be have you all say something uh, at the end here. But I, I want to say, I want to piggyback on something that Ramola said. We've been playing fair. We've been playing legal. And I think uh, this has nothing to do with legal. They own the legal system. They own the banks. They, they control the control mechanism. But they don't control natural law. And natural law says, it's a, it's a, it's a, a uh, golden rule thing, uh, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And in natural law, if you violate somebody, that's never good. And you're being violated constantly. And you're perfectly justified in using force against violence. So if someone's in your driveway or someone's parked out in front of your, let the air out of their tires. I mean, you're, you can use force legitimately uh, outside the law. They're outside the law. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think uh, I just want uh, we've been we've been uh, following these, you know, right to this guy, right to that guy. We're going to try. We're trying to find someone that's not a Nazi. Mm -hmm. uh, and we haven't found anybody. Uh, mm -hmm. So I think we need to. And I'm advising other people that are working with me on other different things. We need to we need to be human and start doing human things. We need to stop the see uh, the child protective services. We need to stop those things. We need to get up and stop them. That's why I was so encouraged by that guy that made that little video and sent it, sent it uh, put it on YouTube to try to help Catherine. He's just one guy, and he's doing. 
He's doing the writing campaign and uh, we'll get frustrated because that's not working. And we'll start doing more and more overt things. On the 25th of March, they're gonna have a big march against the pedophilia in Washington DC because we can't get any action. Nobody will investigate those people. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, it's the time when we need to take action. And I'm telling you, it's okay to take action. It's always okay to use force against violence. It's never okay to use violence. Mark Passio does a wonderful, I don't know what you know him, he's a, he's a guy out of Philadelphia who uh, is, uh, does lectures. He's an ex-Satanist. And he came over to our side. And now he's telling us a lot about what this is doing. Because this is sat satanically inspired. I mean, this has nothing to do with money. This is the dark force. This is the dark state. Mm -hmm. So uh, I just wanted to interject that because I'm passionate about it. And so since we're, we're right here at the edge, uh, before uh, Google is going to cut us off in two hours. I have one thing Go to ahead, say to you. One of the things that I noticed in Mark Rich's book was that these, um, they have enlisted other civilians to, to work against those who stand against the status quo and against the system. So you're not, you're not up against employees of the government. You're up against your neighbors who've been convinced that you are evil and you are out to hurt society in some way. And they believe wholeheartedly that they're doing the right thing by attacking you and trying to eliminate you because you're standing up against the system and the status quo. And most people think they, they just want the status quo. So they've actually been convinced that we're wrong and that we deserve to be under attack because we speak up against the government and the status quo. So I think we need to, to change our focus of attention to the people, the, the ordinary people out there in the neighborhoods who are being bought and convinced that they, sh that they should be against us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the thing though is, you know, even trying to convince them, they're not, they don't get convinced. I hand out <laughs> flyers all the time, they don't care. They just come back and behave in exactly the same way, you know? So yeah. uh, I, I totally hear what Paul is saying. And, uh, you know, I do think everybody has failed us. Our authorities, so-called authorities have failed us. Our human rights groups have failed us. Our, even our most outstanding journalists, people we have, have in the past respected, have failed us. So, you know, what's left? So I think what's left is actually reaching out to people, as Mindy says, but I don't know if that's necessarily our neighbors, but generally people, like, you know, like educated people, like, reach out to them in terms of put your information out there so that physicians know, so that ER physicians know right. that when people come into their ERs, they're not mad when they say they've been implanted or they've been, they're being hit with microwave weapons. They're not mentally ill. These people need physical attention. You know, they don't need mental attention. They don't need a psych psych psychiatrist and so forth. There was an article just recently about, um, I, well, it, it's being kept anonymous as to which part of the U.S. and which city. But a woman, um, an RFID chip was removed from the body of a woman because she, there was an incision. They actually saw it. And so the ER physician, they barely believed that this could be happening in this day and age, but they found a chip inside of her. So, it, you know, it actually hit... The media and it became a news story and apparently they discovered that these chips are being used in sex trafficking of women and even children yes it all and so ER, so er physicians are beginning to wake up you know so in a sense that's what i think we need to do we need to get our information in the hands of physicians in the hands of psychologists in the hands of psychiatrists we need to approach the associations we need to tunnel through and find ways in our society to reach these people to, to help wake them up because these people are still under that spell, that mainstream media spell, you know? Mm -hmm. So, and they're listening to NPR and learning nothing of what's really going on. Yeah. You know? That, that's, I, why, I, that's why we're doing these podcasts. These podcasts yes. are so powerful. You should be on our, in our, in our chair listening to you three. They're powerful broadcasts. 
and we need to get them out. I mean, we have 30 people online now listening. Uh, this, this has got to go viral. Uh, these things have to go viral. We have to send them all over Facebook, all over Twitter. Uh, they need to, yes. this, is the first, this is the first step, waking people up. Yes, I totally agree. I think this is exactly right. What you are doing is exactly right. I mean, this offers us a fantastic avenue. And, you know, we sh we, I, I promise to do my best with social media to get, get the word out there. Because what we have to say and what we are talking about, everybody who's educated needs to know. You know, in the past, we used to think to be educated and to be a responsible adult meant read the newspaper with your morning coffee and go to vote you know, mm -hmm. and, and hand in your boat. <laughs> be an educated citizen, be a responsible citizen. But now it's totally changed. Yeah. Now to, waking up is like a whole different ball game. You know, it's like the newspapers don't give you any information. So you literally have to cull through alternative media to discover what the real truth is. Right, right. So, and, and it's a wonder, in a way, I, you know, I know what you're going through is totally horrible. But uh, had this not happened, you'd be listening to NPR, Pacifica. Yes. You'd be trusting Greenwald. You'd be trusting yes. Snowden and, and the rest of them. Absolutely. So let's I give everybody a chance to kind of say something at the end here. Uh, Catherine, uh, you said so much already. You're, I, have, I have 10 podcasts I can make on the information you've given me. So well, I guess I guess to summarize, and also, sorry, I realized I haven't switched off my microphone. I had to remove the paneling to get to my bookshelf. I just wanted to say one thing. I guess what we're waking up to is that the intelligence agencies, we were never allowed to speak about. They have grown incredibly cr criminal. They have infested everything, our doctors, our media, everything. They're controlling everything. And I just wanted to get this one book out. The guy, Udo Ulf Kotter, he said, bought journalists and German. When he wrote this book, he was, he, I think he was murdered as well. I think everybody who put anything useful out just gets murdered. But he died recently, I think from his fourth heart attack or something like that. To me, it sounds like electromagnetic weapons. Um, but he said that, um, you know, it's how essentially the intelligence agencies and high finance are, are steering the mass media. But here he was mostly talking about how journalists were given stories by the intelligence agencies. I think we'll wake up to a situation whereby we might realize that actually some of the people we call journalists are trained agents. They went through the entire training system. They're first agents and then they get a job as journalists, as a front. And in a situation like that, when the intelligence agencies operate in Gestapo mode, I couldn't actually, you know, last through this without my head being cooked. And I've got a beam drilling into my head here. If I put my hand on, it hurts. Essentially, I will go on trying to operate, trying to shield myself. All of us were utterly crippled by this. We can't have proper jobs. We can't sleep at night. We're being mutilated nonstop. We do need drastic measures. And what I'm going to do for next week is I'm going to continue I'm going through the steps and I'm going to make everything public that I do in, as a public interest investigation. And I will name all the names who are responsible. And it is the community's responsibility to keep that information public, to maintain it publicly. And even if I get murdered, if I die from my injuries, that this information is carried forward, knowing that these are crimes against humanity. They do not have a limitation period and people can sue for the dead. And disabled. Right. And I think <coughs> very good. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, Karen, final. Um, okay. Um, it, it does strike me that we are not only fighting corruption, but cognitive dissonance or normalcy bias, where people will say, You can't tell me that's happening. Right. But they don't realize that they have such a reaction to it that I don't want to hear it. You can't tell me that's happening. And we all know that, co that cognitive, uh, cognitive dissonance comes when somebody does not want to confront it because it would be inconvenient and they're afraid of the consequences. The problem is that if you don't confront it, it rolls over you anyway and eventually. Um, now, going back to defending ourselves, uh, I, if I were on a jury and I heard this story, and I gave the person credibility and I saw all the patents and everything that proves that these things exist, then yes, defending yourself against somebody who's using this type of surreptitious weapon 
I would say, yes, that person was merely defending himself or herself. But the first case of that, where somebody goes out and defends themselves, let's say using force the way that they need to, um, it's going to be one heck of a battle. It's going to be one heck of a uh, judicial battle because the authorities don't want to hear it. They're going to try to suppress anything that shows that you were actually defending yourself. And um, I, at that point in time, I think we as a community have to come out and rally for whoever that turns out to be and make mm -hmm. sure that that district attorney or that location, that city, that town, the sheriff, the, the police, just hit them hard and continuously saying, what do you mean this is not self-defense? And do a million of us have to come there and testify? Mm -hmm. So the first time that happens to test out, mm -hmm. to defend ourselves, and we don't have asymmetrical warfare capabilities, okay? Our defense mm -hmm. is gonna be whatever we can do. So it's not going to be obvious to the first police there that you are defending yourself. And you'll probably have to get arrested and be put through a trial. But we need to, as a community, be prepared to come to that person's defense and blow those authorities out of the water and expose the fact that that person was being murdered and most likely had gone to every single authority in that town, if not that state, and been ignored. So we need to keep that in mind because that case is coming. And we need to be prepared for it. Exactly. Very well said. I'm picturing it as kind of a guerrilla war. <laughs> Striking in that. It's a, it's a war with cowards. It's a war with absolute abject Absolutely. cowards. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, that brings us to the end of this forum. This again, what? Did Ramola sum up? Yeah, Ramola sum. Did you, do you want to say something? Ramola? Oh, I'm done. I think I, you know, I did quite a bit. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. Okay, this comes to the end of another forum. Again, um, I, how, what can I say? Uh, we've exposed so much during this, and we've given so many people so much hope uh, and inspired so many people. We want to get these podcasts out to as many people as possible, spread them on social media. This is the beginning. This is I mean, six months ago, uh, when Eric and I started talking about this subject, I had no idea. Now we have a forum. It's a weekly thing. We get the uh, we get the word out, and we come up with ideas. And uh, I just thank you all for taking the time and uh, participating in this. Thank you very much. And uh, well, thank you for the forum. Yes, thank, thank you for the venue. You, we couldn't do this. Yes, thank you for the platform. Very, very helpful. It's our honor. It's our honor. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, again, you blew me away. Okay. Okay. Well, let's just say goodbye. Okay. Okay. Didn't have an answer on that one, but. <laughs> Wonderful. Bye. Bye.